Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to AAPI Heritage Month, Anti-Asian Sentiment, It's History, Trauma, and Healing. My name is Eric Garagüey. I'm the Advocacy Manager for GLIDE under the Center for Social Justice. Um, I want to introduce our host, Tri Nguyen. He is a Chinese-Vietnamese American. He immigrated to the U.S. when he was seven years old with his parents. He grew up in the Bay Area and earned his BA and MS from University of San Francisco. Over the last 15 years, he has been in the communication role for higher, e higher education, healthcare, and the latest in nonprofit. He currently is Glide's Director of Marketing and Communications. Tree. Thanks, Eric. Welcome, everyone, to our monthly virtual justice series uh, hosted by Glide Center for Social Justice. Uh, today's talk will be centered around the anti-Asian American sentiments, as Eric had introduced. I am truly excited to be part of this discussion. Um, it is near and dear to my heart, and it's also very relevant to the times we're living in now. Uh, before we begin, I'll hand it back to Eric for land acknowledgement. Thank you, Tree. We acknowledge that we are on the unseceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never seceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. Thank you, Tree, and I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Eric. Um, thank you, everybody. First, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our esteemed panelists, and please apologize uh, ahead of time uh, if I get the introductions wrong. First, we have Falga Molinga, who is an elected member of the San Francisco Democratic County Central Committee and a former commissioner and vice president of the San Francisco School Board. He earned a master's in social work from San Jose State University with a concentration on mental health and social justice. Faga founded TOUCH, an organization to support Pacific Islander students, focusing on providing Pacific Islander students and at-risk youth from all marginalized community with a resource to thrive. He also led the creation of Puma Prevent to address consent amongst male student athletes. Currently, Faga is a clinical social worker with Comprehensive Crisis Service Public Health Department. Did I get that right? Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Gaynor Siataga, or goes by G, who is a Pacific Islander of mixed descent. She was born and raised in San Francisco and a native to the Mission and Bayview District. Since the age of 14, she has been an advocate for the underserved, underrepresented, and marginalized communities. She's a proud alumnus and parent of an amazing young teenager in the San Francisco Unified School District. She received her credentials in administration of justice, named valedictorian and graduate honor as a medical specialist in IT in Sacramento, California. She gained experience in politics in her younger years while working under three San Francisco mayors. Her career in public safety, violence prevention and intervention, promoting higher education, and health and wellness has brought her a lifelong commitment to her communities in the city, state, and nation. Did I get that right? So, and then last, and of course not least, I'd like to introduce Nick G. is a descendant of Paper Sons, a native Texan, and a stage production enthusiast. A lot to unpack there. Um, currently, he leads as an advo advocacy manager with a Chinese for Affirmative Action Group, a civil rights organization in San Francisco's Chinatown. His organization, AAPI Equity Alliance and the Asian American Study Department at San Francisco State University are co-founding partners of the National Coalition Stop AAPI Hate. They're on a mission to advance the multiracial movement for equity, social justice, by providing power for our communities while working in solidarity with other communities of color to advocate for a comprehensive solution that tackle the root cause for rape-based hate. As an advocate, he addresses key policy issues on language justice, diversity, voting rights, and ending anti-Asian hate and discrimination. Is that right? Great, thank you. All right, well, um, we'll jump into, uh, I have a number of questions just to throw out there to our panelists and we'll, we'll get this event started. 
Uh, first, as you know, we are celebrating uh, in May, National Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I wanted to ask, what does it mean to you personally? And what exactly what are we celebrating? Um, so why don't I hand it over to Valinga to start us off. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Trey. Appreciate it. Talo Falava, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this event. Uh, truly humbled to be here and sharing spaces with uh, Nick and my sister Ganner. Um, it is AAPI month, you guys. And that is, uh, that's really cool. You know, as a Pacific Islander, I'm Samoan. South Pacific, American Samoa, you know, every time, you know, this month come around, you know, in our community, uh, the sentiment is, uh, I wonder if they're going to remember us this year. <laughs> it's like, I wonder if they're going to remember us this year, right? So I say all that, you know, because uh, it's, you know, it's it's like a, it's a cool thing, but for us, it's also like, are we going to be seen this year, right? Mm -hmm. So it's AAPI month. I say that, <clears throat> you know, shout out to my boy, uh, I am Tony, who won uh, American Idol, right? Uh, but it also is, a um, for me, it's about being seen, right? And every year for us as Pacific Islanders, right? The question is, you know, are we going to be seen this year, right? And it's getting better. It's getting a whole lot better, right? But truly having the space just in general is, is a good thing, you know, so. That's great. How about you, Nick? Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, Tree. I'm really grateful to be here. I think as I consider this month, um, I mean, we are celebrating so many things. There's festivals, there's events, there's, you know, all these things that are happening across different cities and particularly in the Bay Area. Um, but I think as I think about this month, for me, it's about celebrating the legacy of AAPIs who have gone before us, the fully acknowledging the shoulders that which we stand. Um, I think of community leaders, I think of ancestors or past family members, and I think of friends who continue to partner with us as we make strides on behalf of all people to be in solidarity. And I think for me personally this month, as I think about like how I'm going to celebrate or how I am celebrating, I think part of it is taking this month uh, to acknowledge a lot of the great work that our organizations are doing on the ground, but also taking time to pause to pause and to pull back and get a balcony view of where we've been and where we might be going so that we can sustain ourselves to keep dreaming for a better future together. Great, thank you, Nick. How about you, uh, G? What are your, what's your thoughts? Um, thank you, thank you. I'm really um, honored to be here and invited. Uh, and so, um, especially be on the panel with my brother Faunga and, you know, Nick, um, this month, what does it mean? It means summer's coming up. It means kids are about to be out of school. And <laughs> uh, that's exciting. Right. So, um, but as a Pacific Islander, I would say this month, and to be transparent, it really didn't mean so much growing up because we didn't really see, or I didn't see a lot of my heritage being um, seen or being celebrated um, or even known. Um, but I'd have to say that times have changed with a lot of the efforts that, you know, our folks have been doing, especially here in the city of San Francisco and all across, you know, uh, thank you, uh, Brother Faunga, you know, leading that and championing a lot of that, you know, to actually see someone that looked like us being in, you know, an arena that you don't see us there and then not forgetting us as a community and you know bringing us together and it definitely had motivated and prompted us to say you know what you know we can do this and it's time for us to finally you know be recognized and so it's not just a recognition but when people are throwing a lot of words like equity equality you know where did we as pacific islanders fit in and so i can say today um you know, with that movement, I'm really proud now this year for this month to be a Pacific Islander. We have our cultural district. We have policies that have been put into place, you know, here in the city. And it's um, the momentum of just being counted matters now, you know. And so, um, yeah, I'm very proud and happy for this month this year. 
I, I would agree with, with all three of you. You know, what's interesting is um, it used to be just AAPI month. And as you know, the acronym grew. And, and, and I think that's, that's saying something that, that we as people of color are being recognized and, and, and no, we're just not lumped together as Asian American. There's like Asian American, there's Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander. So, so I think we're, we're making a difference and our voice is being heard. And so that's important. Um, but then that, that leads us to um, uh, the darker side where we're here, right? But, you know, we had so much to celebrate this month and, and to acknowledge and to name a few, I'll just pick up some, some highlights here. On, on the politics side, we have Falga, obviously. We have the mayor of Oakland, Shang Tao, is the first Hmong American uh, as a mayor in, in US. We have Rob, Rob Bonta as the first Filipino to serve as California Attorney General. That's huge, right? And in corporate America, the CEO of Microsoft and Google are Indian. And they're Asian American to me. I don't care what anyone says. Um, and then in entertainment, you know, we have the success of Michelle Yeoh, Okihi Juan, and of course, Ian Tongi winning the recent American Idol. That's huge. You know, everywhere you look, you see the success, you see all these amazing things happening that Asian American is doing. Even Sesame Street has an Asian American puppet. So you know that, uh, that the impact is there. But with all this happened, why do you think that anti-Asian sentiments is so prevalent in the past few years? Uh, we've seen all the footage of Asian seniors being attacked, being harassed. So what gives? Where do you think this is coming from? And, and how, how do you, how do you, it has it impacted you personally? Um, well, G, do you want to kick us off? Oh, you're just going to pick on me. Okay. Um, no, go. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, you know, when you mention our elders, um, I come from the old school. So, yeah. you know, we have morals, we have values, you know, even when, you know, I come from humble beginnings. So let's just say I was in gangs, but there's things we still had respect. And there was one thing we would never do is hurt our elders, hurt kids, you know, no matter what um, that is. I think um, overall, because it was happening even before our Asian brothers and sisters brought light to this, this has always been happening, you know, within our um, our Asian community, you know, but then right before the, you know, it kicked off, we had a lot of our Latino elders that were getting hit up, you know, and beat and losing their lives and robbed right here in the mission. And then we started seeing our African-Americans in the Bayview, same thing. And then, you know, uh, our our Asian brothers and sisters. So I think overall, in my opinion and my experience, I'm a crisis responder as well, you know, is seeing that the structure is broken just culturally, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think that's just across the board. Why is it happen uh, more often right now? Sad to say, I mean, you know, back in the days we didn't have social media. So, you know, uh, I, probably say the the more social media has promoted you know this stuff is the more that folks are you know okay you know let's do this even if it's for you know uh laughs or for ratings or whatever the case may be you know I've seen that you know um which is really sad because people are not understanding how you're hurting you know especially our old folks I mean our our elders you know that's all the way wrong it, it really upsets me you know um I was almost going to jail like a few times just hearing that because I just, I, I don't tolerate it, you yeah. know? So, but the point for me is I think overall it's our, our structure is broken, you know, um, as far as our, our moral morals and values, I don't know where the gap uh, uh, began or where it stopped, you know, those teachings, mm -hmm. but that's what I see. Maybe my, my brothers and them, have you know other insights on that yeah um nick what says you sure thanks um uh, yeah I, I i think it's it's such a, a prevalent issue and, and for us at stop api hate you know we've collected over eleven thousand incidences of reported hate and harassment just in the last three years alone so again i think as you talk about the trauma across communities of color there's a real impact that we're seeing that it's not just APIs, right, but that we're seeing hate in all forms impacting folks on the margins, right? And we have to name that from up front. 
Um, but specifically at Swap API Hate, I can speak on so the work that we're doing and how we're responding to it because you know we see this rise, we see the rise of anti-Asian hate sentiment throughout COVID-19 when AAPIs were being blamed and scapegoated for causing the virus. We heard it from 45 saying China virus, Kung flu, that only inflamed the community to respond. And by community, I don't mean um, communities of color. I mean like white nationalists. I mean the folks that really don't want us here. And so I think for our team, as incidences were occurring, our team created a platform community for community members to speak up, respond, and submit anonymous reports. And as we've been analyzing our data, it, our data and research shows that hate takes forms in a lot of different ways, and specifically in public spaces and urban spaces where we live as well. Some of the most common forms of hate include harassment, assault, and shunning. Um, sometimes it doesn't always have to go as, as far as a um, necessarily a physical violent attack, but it can be a verbal, it can be mental, it can be someone following you, it can be someone um, telling you you can't come inside of a business because of the way that you look or because you're wearing a mask. There are just these uh, incidences of hate that we are seeing. And in terms of spaces, we saw that two and in five incidents actually took place in public spaces. And so this meant streets, sidewalks, parks, hiking trails, beaches, and even public transportation. So as we talk about our elders, we talk about our seniors, we talk about community members who do not have the privilege of having cars or have to rely on public transit or rely on city infrastructure to get around. This really impacted folks on their day-to-day -day autonomy. And so these are just some of the facts that we're seeing. But I appreciate it, Gaynor, as you were kind of taking a step back and like asking us to look, where did this actually come from? Part of the work that we're doing at Stock API Hate is we see that these, it, these incidences of hate are not isolated to COVID-19 not just in the last three years. Instead, they're part of an ongoing narrative and reality that's parallel to institutionalized racism and discrimination from the past and present that have impacted not just me or other AAPIs, but BIPOC folks. And so I just wanted to share a really quick example of kind of what I mean by this parallel hate of that we see this past and present. In 2020, AAPIs were scapegoated, Kung flu, anti-Asian right, right. We saw this as a leading historic rise of hate incidents. But actually, in the 1900s, San Francisco authorities quarantined over 25,000 Chinese people after just a single case of the buponic plague was documented. 25,000 people in one case. And then soon after, officials used the threat of the hookworm to keep Chinese and Italian, or excuse me, Indian immigrants out. So there's this narrative of just keep, we don't want you here. And so this sentiment of hate and being othered and not belonging is timeless. It's repeated over and over and over again. And in response, Stop API Hate is prioritizing civil rights protections, community safety and justice, and ethnic studies to stop hate in all forms. And I think as we think about this month, particularly, it's not just about the sense of belonging, but it's calling folks in to take action. Because, and to just kind of wrap up my thoughts is, anti-Asian hate really is motivated, like the work that we do to address this issue is inspired. Um, because it's inspired by the idea and the value of solidarity, that when we act in solidarity together, we can heal and we can win. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that's very insightful and a lot of uh, really good information. And um, I'll throw it over to Faga. Um, any response to what G said or what Nick said and, and your thoughts on, on where the anti- Asian hate or anti-Asian sentiment is, is, is coming from. Um, it's interesting. So like I'm Pacific Islander, right? And like when you like I want to like kind of talk it talk 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 about it from like different perspectives, right? Like uh just in general, just like you know, growing up in schools here in the city, right? Like people people have been picking on Asian kids for the longest, right? Just for the longest, just, just pure, just like bullying, right? That's just been happening forever, right? In, in, in addition to all the uh, systemic like racism and like the oppression that's happened like throughout the years, but it has also gotten to a place where it's like, it's just like individual, like, you know, I almost like feel like there's like a, a minority envious thing going on here, right? Like people have like this false, uh, you know, perspective of like, you know, you know, the minority Asian, you know, and like are taking it to a whole nother level, 
right? And I think that that like needs to be like squashed and just like erased, right? Like that needs to go. Um, and then just like, you know, if, if you know, you, you've been to school with like, you know, our Asian brothers and sisters, you know, they're quiet, they're very reserved, you know, not all of them, right? But you know, they're to themselves and they, they just kind of put their heads on and do their work and they're very nice kids, right? And people just, you know, bullies, you know, you have Pacific Islander kids who are bullying like Asian kids, right? Like they take advantage, you know? And like, I think like, you know, how folks, you know, um, their demeanors and who they are as, as, you know, as a culture, like, I think people like, uh, you know, really have preyed on it and take advantage of like, you know, individuals. And I think that in itself is just absolutely wrong. We need to kill that. That, that, that is like stuff we need to just be addressing every day. That's just like basic behavior. Right, like that is just no zero tolerance at, at all, right? Um, but I also want to talk about like you know, because um, you know when they when we talk about aging hate, right? Like most PIs would be like, well, that ain't got nothing to do with Pacific Islanders, right? Mm -hmm. Like why are they clunking us in it? Because at first it was like AAPI hate, like all across the country, right? And so like you know when it happened, you know, and it's not like PIs are not like oh like we don't care like we are we're always going to stand in solidarity with our Asian folks right we're always going to be there you know side by side right but I think I think Gaynor or uh, Nick may have mentioned it right like the the level of like you know hate is very like fluid it's very different right like how PIs experience hate is very very different right like if you look at the murder rates in San Francisco compared to like you know the murder rates of like you know uh, the homicide rates sorry the homicide rates you know. Mm -hmm. you, you see the the pi numbers like skyrocket right and you know it, it's just it's just so different so like for me it's like you know um one i want to just lift it up so we can continue having the conversation like on a on a wider wider spectrum right um and then i do want to close it out with just saying you know i think it is uh one you know the leaders of this country just stirring up a bunch of just like hate i think that that has to be addressed and that needs to go. But then two, also, I think it is like really critical that we understand how resources are being distributed, right? Because if folks are being like, say, say people are in this, right? You know, like, okay, why do you have more than, you know, because folks are like, why do you have this and I don't have this, right? Like, I think it is, uh, it is the responsibility of like the leaders and the government to be able to, we're talking about equity, right? Distribute equitable right and so like going back to this whole word around like you know how are we able to see everyone and be able to provide resources for everyone it's super easy to say right but also very hard to implement you know but those are my two cents you know very complicated but i think you know day, day to day we just really have to correct people's behaviors and then like on a systemic and leadership level you know we have to continue to push forward no, I agree with you. Nick, look like you had uh you you had a response or some thoughts you wanted to share. Yeah, I think um for I think there's a level that you had just provided just thinking about on a it, on, on these different rings, if you will, of, of the systemic issues, right? The interpersonal, right, the inner healing, the inner work that we have to do to massage out or to get rid of or to heal or to address the hate that's within us. And then it's about the relationships that we have with one another. And thinking about the resources that we have and what is actually equity as we think about these systems that we are advocating for right or the budgets that we're calling for um to serve our communities and then it's that higher up right of like who are the leaders these bad players that maybe in some senses like um we've elected to represent us um i'm from texas and so as i think about a lot of my peers and siblings and family members back home i think about the folks that we have elected that we didn't think that would mistreat us yet they are and so how do we begin to create more of a voice and, and more pipelines for aapis to be a part of civic engagement um so i think that's just kind of what i'm feeling and sensing of like if there are these levels right that we have to get folks involved in that i'm like oh yes let's do that there's, there's layers to it for sure yeah i think i think there's a lot to unpack there um and and, and it's hard to it's hard to really put our, our our mind around what is the 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 moment or the source of the issue but you're right it has always been there and growing up in the Bay Area, you see it time and time again, and you experience it. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll skip to another question here, jumping down, but how do we begin to, to deal with these issues? How do we start to heal and come together? Because obviously, like you said, PI, 
it's different than like the four of us are completely different even though we're lumped together in 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 america as asian american but we're very distinct and very different so how do we work together and how do we begin to heal and overcome the uh the anti-asian hate that's that's going on out there i'll throw it out to Faga kind of start us off uh how do we heal the anti-asian hate you know, how do we come together um man I, I think how do we like we we have to just continue like uh so so he, so so my thing is like you know the facts are the facts right like the facts are the facts right like let's just start with like the poverty rate right let's just start with like you know let's just go there right like huh? If, if you're trying to like really address like a streamline of like unity and cohesiveness amongst like a group of folks, right? We have to address the disparity amongst all of us first and foremost, because, you know, we can all come together, continue coming together, right? But there is just a huge disparity, a huge disparity, housing disparity, education disparity, workforce disparity, right? Like, where does the conversation then start from there, right? And then I think once we're able to acknowledge that, um, I love San Francisco. There's a bunch of good folks out here, Cynthia, you know, and all these guys, CPA, you know, uh, and then it's, then it really is around the intentionality, you know, and how do, because it really is about leadership. It really is about leadership. How do we then come together as leaders, be able to identify, you know, the gaps and the strengths and address them together, right? And it has to be like, you know, 10, 20 year plan, right? But <clears throat> The truth is, you know, we are all in different places. We all come from like different cultures. The data is very is very separate, right? We're like AA and HPI, you know, politically because they categorize us in a group. Well, like some of us are lower class, some of us are middle class, some of us are, you know, it's, it's some of us are educated, some of us are, you know, don't have college degrees, right? The conversation is so fluid and complex that we have to be able to acknowledge. For me, we have to be able to acknowledge those as we come to the table and have honest discussions. And then commit to some plans on how to how to move forward. That's deep. How about uh, G? What what um, what were your thoughts? Well, I think um, you know, I and I always say this as a San Francisco native, born and raised, still here, probably going to die here. You know, I love my city. I think what I was always prideful of is that our city is so diverse, right? And for me, when we talk about all these um, systemic, you know, issues that we have, I'm not gonna lie, for me, I put uh, racism at the very bottom. Maybe I, I viewed racism in a different, you know, form. Like racism to me is so much hate that you can see somebody that is of culture and you can't stand that culture so much, you're gonna let them die and keep walking. That's how much, you know, racism to me, right? Now I said, one thing in the city is, you know, there's discriminatory, you know, we, if you don't get the job, it's probably because we don't like your hair or, you know, something like that, you know? Um, and that was how I grew up. I was always like, you're cool, I'm cool. I don't care what you are. And, you know, we go back to, you know, um, I saw a lot of bullying. I saw him definitely very strong with our Asian brothers and sisters. Um, and for me, I couldn't stand bullies. So some people thought I was a bully because then I started bullying the bullies, you know, and it was always messing with our Asian brothers and sisters or our, our undocumented folks, you know, because, they're, you know, those isolated um, communities or folks that just wasn't bothering nobody, they do their thing. And I couldn't stand that. You know, that that's me. Um, but then also, to be honest, you know, I know a lot of people look at um, our Pacific Islanders, us as Pacific Islanders, say, oh, you know, they're bullies or whatever. But we are bullied, too. Some of us don't want to admit it. But, you know, because of our size, you know, you got a fifth grader that's like 20 pounds, but a PI, you know, we 80 pounds. <laughs> You know, and then we're like almost six feet when you get to middle school. It was like it, it was a lot. And so I think education definitely, you know, um, be more culturally, you know, competent. And that's in all these institutions, you know, um, that's one way. But, you know, the best way we could come together. And I've seen that challenge, you know, as we tried to organize um, our own people. 
you know, um, our own people to organize and say, you know, come on, enough is enough. Like, man, we're, we're like, you know, the dogs in the corner waiting for somebody to throw a bone. We're not even at the table. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. and, um, and so for me was because, you know, we, uh, grew up or I grew up very diverse was reaching out to all of, you know, my brothers and sisters, including our AAs and saying, Hey man, what's up? Like, you know, you got to support us, you know, we support you, we're not asking, you know, we haven't never asked for nothing, you know, it's time, and, you know, the response for me was amazing, you know, we work with CAA, we work with, you know, all of our other, you know, Asian brothers and sisters, and, um, and I think that's where it begins, that's how we come together, like, you know, Fanga has mentioned, as, you know, I don't consider myself a leader, I'm a community server, but if that's the, you know, if that's the light that our community, you know, I always figure my title is what I earn and what the community tells me I am. And those are people I serve. So if they say, okay, Gaynor, you're, you know, you're our community leader, then you know what? They, I'm, they're standing on my shoulders. So I'm like, you know, we have to set the example. And how do we do that? Is they're seeing us work together. They're seeing us calling each other brothers and sisters they're seeing us respect one another support one another and that goes a long way with the community you know what i'm saying it's just like if i come in to your hood and you know but the folks in your hood know you they don't know me they're going to only respect me because they respect you you know and and so vice versa right and so that's that's how i see it, it takes us to stand up and, you know, come to the table, have those hard conversations, you know, get those elephants out the room, you know, because, <laughs> oh, trust me, it's a lot of criticism, you know, they're like, oh, how can you work with, you know, uh, all these other cultures, they, they always get everything, we don't get nothing, you know, this and that, and it's like, yeah, but were we ever organized too? It's like, you know, it's this catch 24, but it's like, no, you know, today is today, it's 2023. You know, nobody, you know, uh, nobody's going to look out for us, but us. And so either, you know, I said, the only thing I want segregated is the resources and services when they're allocated because we don't get nothing. But, you know, we're like, other than that, you know, I don't trip so much about, you know, um, what the government has lumped us together for, or, you mm -hmm. know, none of that for real matters to me because regardless of what all of our, our people you know, struggle. All of our people have disparities. All of our people, you know, need that. And for me, I'm just a humanitarian like that. So, you know, I look at people as humans, not so much as race. And I wish we could, you know, like that is the actual reality, but we know it's not, right? right. And I refuse right now to set us back thousands of years where again, now people are segregating you know, or trying to tear us apart or, you know, whatnot. So I think that's where it starts. It starts from us. And then, you know, continue to have our young people too, you know, being part of it so that they can understand why does it matter to love the next person or to respect the next culture. So, yeah. Thank you. That's, uh, you're, you're, you're spot on there. Um, Nick, what, do you have any thoughts sure yeah if you thought, yeah gee thank you for right, for saying that i think as i am learning about the landscape and the organizations the collaboratives and networks of organizations and communities of color coming together to address critical issues in the city of san francisco i'm seeing how we as a collaborative or a network are beginning and we are constantly like working through some of those cultural layers and also asking that question of what are the needs of your is of your community? How do we fold that in into this meeting agenda so that we can bring it up at the next campaign or the next budget ask or the next? And so I think there's this part where we're sharing in the work together and we all have our hands in it and we're linking arms. And I think it's in this work too that we share these stories of success that there is this cross-racial solidarity happening. And I think it's like you said as well of inviting folks in Right, as we are setting the groundwork and standing on the legacy of others, we at the same time also invest in the next generation, our, our, the students, we invest in our children, we invest in this next part of the legacy that will continue on this story because our story doesn't end here, 
and the people in power are not going to be the ones uh, to write that for us. And so I think as like, that is something that's coming up for me is I'm like, ooh, it's in the work that we actually do this solidarity. It's not in the virtue signal. Like, I think we can throw up like, yes, I stand in solidarity with you. It's really easy to say it, but then it's even harder to do it. And it's even harder to embody the values of justice when we say that we're about the community. And I think that's when we start to see healing happen because we start to ask this question, well, who is my neighbor and how do I know them and what are their needs? And so I think that's like on a basic sense, but then we, when we amp it up to the systemic issue, then we start to see the real issues that are impacting BIPOC folks. We start to dig into the history. And so I think for me, a lot of the learning and the healing has actually been in my own education and learning from other leaders and other folks in the BIPOC story, in the BIPOC narrative, because as we learn about the issues, we confront the realities that we can't be blinded by, that we can't let our privileges blindside us to say, well, the comforts in my family and my home is good, I'm gonna forget about everybody else. I think, I think it's in this moment when we stop asking what has happened, how do we get here? I think that's when the struggle, that's when we keep hurting ourselves. So I think the healing is in the own learning that the onus has to come from you and me to learn about one another's struggle, mm -hmm. but to say, okay, I'm gonna move forward now and I wanna learn with you. How can I, how can I be an advocate with you and for your community? That's great, thanks, Nick. And I do wanna acknowledge Kimberly comment in the chat around accessibility to information and engagement. Totally agree. Thank you for that comment. Um, but I do want to go back to what you said earlier, Faga, around equity and disparity among our our community, uh, our own people. You know, at Glide and uh, at C you know, Cecil William and Janice has been fighting that fight for the past 60 years, right? Fighting for equity, fighting for for our for people who are underrepresented. Uh, for who are marginalized. And, and that's been going on for about six years. And I feel like we're taking three steps forward and four steps back. Like, when is the change gonna come, right? Like that, that Sam Cooke, the, the song. I feel like we're, 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 we're keep fighting and we're ch chipping away as mountain, but I feel like it hasn't, it hasn't changed much. Do you, think, do you think changes on the horizon? Is it light in a tunnel or what will it take? I think change, I think change is slow. Change is very slow. Yeah, very, very slow. Um, what we're afforded today, you know, as uh, like, like us for right here talking, right? Like our grandparents went through something very different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, um, I think the work is very, very slow. And I've already like made up in my mind that like the dreams that I think that I would like to see for us. So, so for me, like, I would love to. So in San Francisco, the Samoan population, it's 70% 70, 70 poverty rate, right? 70%. Let that sink in. That's huge, right? Yeah. So in my lifetime, right? I'm 40 years old, right? In my lifetime, you know, am I going to see the pearly gates with everyone? You know, is it? So I've already told myself, if we could turn that 70 around to 30%, by the time I'm I'm done, you know, I, I, you know, have my last breath, that to me is success, is a success. And so, but that I know is going to take probably another 40 to 50 years, God willing, not that long, right? But, but change is slow and Cecil and, you know, Janice, you know, have experienced that themselves. I, I do think the work though, really, that we're talking about, this work around community, um, relationship, you know, uh, values that are being cultivated, it is what we're doing right now. It, it, it's on the ground, right? It's on the ground in the community, like the partners, the communities, because they're the ones that are actually intentionally coming together, right? There's still a bunch of like other segregation happening amongst classes, right? That are not actually doing this intentional work, right? So if the work is going to continue to happen, like we need to continue investing in the work on the ground that folks are doing on the ground, right? Folks in Chinatown to the Bayview, you know, oh, we'll talk about San Francisco and the Tenderloin, right? Mm -hmm. Out in Richmond, right? Because they're the ones that are actually caring. Not everybody in the city is talking about unity and community. Let's just be honest. They're not talking about equity, right? But the folks on the ground, that's the folks on the ground are, right? And so if we're going to be able to advance this work, right, we need to continue to, you know, push and also be intentional about, you know, driving policies that are going to invest in, in our, in our workers, 
right? People that are working in nonprofits, right? Folks that are in our public education, right? That, that's huge. The, 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 the future is in the, is, is in the kids right now. You know, and we got to take care of the elders too, to be honest with you. My, my heart is with the kids and the elders. Right. Speaking of heart, uh, G, you, you threw up a heart. I guess you, you agree with Fago saying, yeah, you want to uh, elaborate a little bit more? I'm always going to agree with what my brother says. I mean, <laughs> I'm just throwing up the heart. I'm like a cheerleader. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> but yes, definitely. I, I super agree. Um, he talk about change, you know, I'm close to his age too, but I think I'm younger, mm. I'm, not sure. I'm older, but, um, all my life growing up here, I, you know, one thing that I always have prayed for, um, is, you know, for harmony and peace. And I've always heard harmony, you know, they teach us that in school and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's not just the different voices learning how to blend and singing because I don't know how to sing. But, you know, it's that harmony. But I, I, I've never seen it throughout the whole entire, you know, like, say, the whole community. But I have seen it in, in pockets of spaces within, you know, the city. And it's beautiful, you know. And so, you know, like Brother Fanga was mentioning we don't know, you know, when God calls us home, but for, you know, me too is if he was to call me tomorrow, what difference did I make, you know, in my time, you know, what did I contribute? And, you know, one thing about being um, really grounded in culture and spirituality is we're always remembering our ancestors. Some people think that this worked because now you you know, you understand or see Pacific Islanders. Everybody knows Pacific Islanders. I even make fun of it. I'm not going to lie. I said, now everybody wants a PI friend, you know, because um, we're all over now. But this work didn't just start yesterday. We've been existing in this city for over 100 years, you know. And so I always take it that each era or each generation contributes something. Our ancestors have contributed what they have, uh, you know, after them. And then it's our time and what we, what do we contribute, you know? And I can say that the change did come very, very, very slow, you know, but I can say um, what I've seen in a positive light so far is that I have been able to pay witness to some form of change with all of us that's in this room and many of us that are not, you know, but uh, definitely, I mean, like for example, we have a Fatsamo initiative in, in U.S., you know, in our school district. Thank you. Um, you know, we have a cultural, a PI cultural district. We have a Williams. Act. We have all these. Those are just policies. But now we also have a PI resource hut. We have, you know, Samoan Community Development Center. We have more programs um, and groups that are stepping up that have never been funded but have been doing this work like for years, for decades, no funding and support whatsoever, you know, from the city. And now it's being recognized. Now it's being acknowledged. We've always been around, you know, and it's like, come on, man, you know us. We went to school together. We were your best friends. We we're neighbors. Like, you know, how can you could only see us then, but you couldn't see us when it came to supporting us. But it's okay. Like we're here now. And so I see the change. I would love, love, love to see more change. I would love to see everyone on an equal level playing field. I would love to see this thing called equal, you know, equity and all that kind of stuff. And I think if we just continue to do what we're doing, you know, I've seen the biggest solidarity, you know, during the pandemic. It really touched my heart to see us all rock together, to try to do what's best and save, you know, our communities, you know, and if it wasn't for the fast actions, you know, like whether it started in a mission or, you know, community, but it went all across, we shared our models, we shared our resources, we shared, you know, when nobody knew what was going on. And then after it's like, man, we still rocking together. Now we're like brothers and sisters, like, what's up? You want to go to lunch? Like, and that really brought me to there is hope. There's hope. But we just got to continue doing what we're doing. 
don't right. let don't let the politics you know like just uh divide us because that's all it's been doing yeah nick do you have hope i do i think as i as i listen to paga and um and gain i'm like you are also the like the leaders that I am also turning to to listen to and learn from. I I think as probably the youngest person here on this panel, I'm like, yeah. I think as I hear the the level of work um, that you have done to invest in the PI community, to invest in your own community, there are changes that you have seen that you, that but simply just cannot be named just here in this in this conversation that you've seen accomplishments and wins. And I think as you hold on to those, I also sense this like feeling that you pass that on to the next generation which includes people like me too um and like beyond that and i think as as you're saying this i'm like wow like you both have been in this work for so long and you've committed to it and i think that's a gift i think that's actually a piece of hope that i'm holding on to that it is possible for us to continue to to move in solidarity to recognize where we need um to to address disparities across our communities but it's also the fact that there are leaders that like yourselves who have somehow figured out how to sustain yourself, how to be in this work and how to encourage folks like me to continue to push in it and how even the, the four of us could like work together to continue to to, to represent our communities and, and to be in solidarity. So I think there is this hope that we have that folks are wanting to, to link arms and we have to give them those on ramps and we have to entrust them um, with the work as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I do have a, a small sense of hope as well. Um, the fact that, you know, as you know, the system, the man, the system never really takes us seriously, right? But together, when we're bonded and we're unified, that's when our voices become amplified and becomes loud. And that's when we earn that seat at the table because now they have to take us seriously, right? And the fact that we're all here, we're coming together, um, it's gonna make a difference. But like Fangan said, it's, it's, gonna, it's slow. And then I think that's the frustrating part is like, why does it have to be so slow? We, I want it happen now, you know, and, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to make that happen, right? How do I make a difference so that my kids, when they grow up, they'll be in a slightly different world than where we are in today, right? And, and I, th I, I don't, do you have any tips or ideas on, on how to make change happen faster and, and move the mountain? Can I? Can I, uh, yeah, please to that. Um, you know, I made a remark in one of the city meetings, and what you mentioned, you know, I was talking about that, and uh, one of the public officials or political officials, I'm not going to say her name. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say her name. Anyway. Um, you know, she turned around and said, oh, Gaynor, with your conspiracy theories. Hmm. And I had to turn around and tell her, I said, you know what? What's a conspiracy to you is a reality for us. And so I say that with, at the end of the day, we know these systems, these systems are never made for us because it wasn't made with us. You know, you cannot like sit here and come up with a solution um, or what you say is a solution. You know, oh, this is for you. This is for your people. But how can you do it? You know, how can you do it for us without us? You know, and and that's always been like that. Or we would come up with these ideas of what I call Illuminati meetings. You know, these are the vaccine meetings from the vaccine meetings, right? That not everybody is invited to. But, you know, you come up with this amazing idea, something that is effective. Like, I don't care about being successful. Anybody could be successful. Is how effective will that be? And will it have longevity? Like, when I'm long gone, will the next generation be able to pick up and continue that? Will they be able to prosper? Will they able to be, you know, beneficial, you know, and then pass that on, right? And so, you know, when I see that, you know, at the end of the day, we're like, okay, you know, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Can we make it go faster? Um, I've seen things, I've seen change happen fast, but I've seen it stopped fast too. That's our reality. 
if you ever notice when something goes truly effective and it's working within our community, that is by our community, right? It only lasts. It's very short-lived, you know? And so it's, it's historical that it's always been like that. And I think what isn't um, that what is new is going back to this standing in solidarity and it's understanding to respect one another, you know, um, stop hating on each other. There's so much hate. There's so much anger, so much envious. And I get it because I'm trauma informed. I get it. You know what I'm saying? If I was never trauma informed, I'd probably be the same way, but I understand, right? We all have struggles. We all have disparities, but what people don't know is if we fight together for one another, eventually these folks, the ones that build these systems would be like, you know, we can erase them or at least move them out the way and do what we have to do, right? For the betterment of the entire community instead of one or the other or none, you know? So um, that's how I feel that we've been breaking it. Um, I've been seeing it across the board. It's been beautiful. I don't know if I'm the only one seeing it, but um, I'm in the trenches and then I come outside the trenches just to to see. Because sometimes when you're in something, you can't see the whole picture, right? So sometimes you got to come outside the picture, even the picture frame, like come outside to the wall and be like, okay, how's it looking from out here? And I started seeing like all of our folks of culture we're rocking at tables together. We're fighting for each other. We, I see that public comments now, like, hey, we're here standing in solidarity for this and that. And you know what? That's beautiful. And I, I'm just saying that because I know a lot of us are always looking at what's negative and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I also want to highlight and acknowledge that there is work and there's a lot of positive too, you know, and so that can help hopefully motivate the rest of our community like it's happening you know so and then we got to weed out all these other people i don't mind doing that <laughs> at all right tree i want to tree can i yeah. jump in yes please <clears throat> thank you sis um so i've been in this work for 17 years right straight out of undergrad jump right into it right 17 years 2006 right and when i hear you tree what I, 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 and I'm like, man, I, I understand what that brother is talking about, right? Like, and I say that because, you know, that for me, there's a couple of things that like, how do we get, like you said, how do we get there? Like, can we, can we be there like yesterday, right? Like for me, the, the turning point in my life in this work really came around and then just as simple as this, right? Like around personal healing. Right. Like if you're in this work, you got to take care of yourself. Right. Let's just let's just start with us. Right. Just start with us because because I'm, I'm addressing this question that Tree brought up. Right. Like, how do we get there? Right. Because the getting there thing is it, it very is a personal thing. Right. And a lot of us in the field are carrying so much desire, hopes and dreams that continues to come. Up. So so first, first and foremost, and we'll break it off into the macro. Right. Like. There's a lot of like self-care and self-healing that we have to do on the job to, to really for me to come around some acceptance to what this thing really is, right? What it really is, what it really is. That's one. And then two, you know, um, we're walking our communities through this thing, right? Like we're, we're head, we're head, we're hand holding all the way through this thing. Like, come on, right? We're hand holding, we're hand holding, you know, directly and the movement, right? And the movement, right? So, and I say that because you know, the thing that, you know, to me, just kind of like putting like, you know, something very tangible around this is like, you know, we're all like, you know, AAPI, right? Like mental health is so big in our community and we need to step that up 1,000, 1,000%, 1,000%, right? Like I'm a therapist, right? I do crisis work, right? I'm, I've been in so many homes and mental health, it is not colorblind, right? It, it, it goes after everyone everyone and so as our so because because we're also dealing with like migration you know folks coming you know from the motherland you know coming from like Samoa coming from China coming from Vietnam 
you know? So we have to be able to like hold that space and allow them to be able to process that as they move into like, you know, Filipino young women have like some of the highest uh, suicide rates, right? Very brilliant individuals, right? Graduating, being successful, right? But folks are still also acculturating into this country, right? Acculturating into this country. So when we talk about like, you know, getting there right it's like getting there and also repairing everything that has caused that has been created through the uh through the journey right so i'll just leave it like that no that's that you, you're absolutely right i think self-healing and recognizing the, the the root cause of it the of of struggles you know comes within ourselves as well so that's very true uh, i have a follow-up question to that but i wanted to hand over to nick did you have a last thought on uh change and and what have you but uh thank you nick uh gee i do i do really resonate what you said really resonate with me is that when something is made for us by us it's truly impactful and i think that's that oftentimes that doesn't happen though and, and representation is key right and i think i think we need to speak up and 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 and, and claim our our space in order to have the representation be able to put changes in place but Following to what you're saying, Faga, I think part of the, the challenge for, for me and I know a lot of Asian American is, is, it, is this internal struggle between being an American, right, and being true to our heritage. And how do you deal with that hyphen of Asian hyphen American, right? And we're stuck in the middle. Um, and it's an internal struggle because sometimes it's like, I'm an American, call, recognize me as American, but at the same time, my heritage is, is, is not. So how do you how do you deal with that? And I think that goes part with the mental health as well. It's a, it's a big it's a big internal problem. Uh, Faga, you wanna? <laughs> that's in, that's kind of your say, tree. Ask the geopolitical question. Let's get busy. Ask the geopolitical question because this literally for me is like you know we we go through the same thing right like you know. We're, you know, when are we American and when are we Samoan? Mm -hmm. right? We're American and when are we in Samoan? But this geopolitical question, though, for me is very key, right? It's very, very key, right? Because, um, well, shoot, you didn't ask the question, so I don't want to jump to it. Um, that's a great question, right? That is a great question. And, and that's what I brought up earlier in terms of being able to process and help individuals go through that, you know, uh, Go, go through that thought process, right? Because a lot of folks, and, and here, here's the thing too, right? Here's the thing too, right? Like individuals are coming here from like, you know, say say like, say maybe you're Chinese, right? Like you're coming here, you're in uh, America, right? There's a Chinatown pretty much anywhere in the globe you go, right? I was literally just in South Africa like a week ago and there's a Chinatown out there, right? So like when individuals are coming into, you know, locations, you know, we we'll use our Chinese businesses, for example, right? Like infrastructure is already in place for people to be able to like, you know, jump into a pathway, right? Mm -hmm. So is, is, that, that's not the same for like, uh, you know, Samoans and Pacific Islanders, right? And so where was, where was I going with that? I was going somewhere. I had it. I had it. I had it. It's, it's, it's getting ready to come back. It's getting ready to come back, right? Um, oh, let me say this. Um, so, so, so because pathways are because pathways are so clear in, in certain groups, I feel like you know, I feel there's an opportunity for folks actually to hold on to their cultures, right, uh, better than other folks, right. Like, um, you know, one thing around this is language. Like, language is really huge, right. Like, if you see language in like you know uh, the Samoan community is starting to disappear, right, because there's no like uh, cultivation points or access uh, centers to be able to like keep that together, right. And so like you know. As we're coming here, you know, in America, it's, it's like, you know, can we be ourselves or, or are we now forced to assimilate into being American, right? Like that's the, so for, for, for me, it's like a fight of like our personal identity, right? Like at, in times there is no, there is no opportunity to pick if I could be one or the other, right? It almost feels like it's being stripped away and all you really have at the end of the day is what they're teaching you in the schools about us, right? And so, um, but it, it, it's, it's an issue, man. It's an issue yeah. for, you know. A lot of folks are migrating into this country. Nick, do you uh, do, does that? Do, do you have that internal dialogue as well, or or how do you help other people deal with that? 
Yeah, I think that's a it's a it's a really complex question as we think about like what does it mean to be an Asian American? Um, what does it mean to be Asian American Pacific Islander? I, I think um, there's this word right that we oftentimes hear that Fago brought up, which is assimilate. We always assimilate, assimilate, assimilate. And I think that that's actually like a really harmful word for our community here, because I think what our communities actually do, and this is actually what I think communities of color do, is that they integrate. They bring in both their cultural value and their ass and, and the things of home, and then they begin to integrate that into politics, school, friend groups. I, and I remember growing up as a kid, it's like, I go to my grandparents' house and there's one way of behaving, there's one way of being. I'm at home with my parents who are like a third generation Asian American, and that's another way of being, my grandparents being more traditional. I go to school with predominantly black and brown students, that's another way of code switching and trying to integrate. Then there's church, then there's politics, then there's those, all these different avenues. And so I think for AAPIs, it's in folks of color, it's this question of how do we begin to integrate and see the value of who we are? Because I, I think as a collective community for AAPIs, yeah, I think we're a collective community. We oftentimes get lumped together, which isn't true. Like there are very distinct um, and beautiful things about the multicultural, multiracial like diaspora that we are. We speak in multiple languages. We have different practices across Pan-Asia. It's very complex. But again, there's that internal dialogue, right? Or that tension that we oftentimes have that struggle where it's like, well, they're always gonna see me as an outsider. They're always gonna question my loyalty to the States, my loyalty to this country. And that's a really, really harmful narrative that the dominant community has repeatedly put on our shoulders. And I would actually say some of the words that have um, kind of helped shape my response here is thinking about um, Helen Zia, who's a profound Asian American organizer, journalist, community leader, activist, who recently stated in an article that Asian Americans have been slammed for being cartoon characters. Um, we've been called several horrible names that I won't repeat here. And, and I think these caricatures that folks see us as, I think sometimes like we've lived into those. And, and maybe it's not as far as like, we really like dress the part, but I think we we silence ourselves. Maybe it's like we begin to feel like we don't belong here. We begin to internalize that narrative. And, and I think Helen Zia's call to action to our community is for us to move beyond these racial slurs and to take ownership and to really reclaim this narrative of who we are. Because I think we need to start to transform our communities, that we are communities of strength and of influence and of beauty and of something good to share with others. And, and I think she closes by kind of wrapping up this out of like, this is a battle that doesn't die. That as someone who's in the in the in-between space, who's constantly having to renegotiate over and over again, it's remembering and holding on to that value that we are a community of strength and influence, that we have something to offer. And to also honor like the facts and parts of me that are Confucian, that I still want to respect and honor my my elders, the people that have gone before me. They do have wisdom. Right, there is a part of me that I should stay silent when someone of um, of a higher status or of an elder that is speaking. I, I want to listen because I want to I want to learn from their past. And I want to learn from the good things that they have to offer me as well. But and then on this other end, right, as I think about my grandparents who have gone before me, who taught me so much, I also think about where we are today as advocates, as Asian American advocates, as API advocates. We're in the position now where we have to get out there and vote. We have, to, we have to keep going after, we have to keep engaging, we have to keep knocking on doors, we have to get to know our community, we have to be in relationship with our neighbors. I think as I consider where my family has been as they integrated their lives here in the 60s, in the civil rights, moving into the 80s and 90s, all these, it's like they didn't have the privilege that we have today. And I think we should take advantage of that, that we can be in solidarity, we can be on phone calls, we can share space with one another and people won't second guess that, right? We can actually change that narrative and say it's good. And I think to me, that's that's a way of taking up space and to really living into who we are and, and to just being in our community. Yeah, um, I have a follow-up question to that, but I wanted to hand it over to G to um, share any thoughts you might have on the, the internal struggle and dialogue. Um. I think that was one of my biggest challenge of my whole entire career of uh, service. Um, 
you know, I myself, I, I'm mixed, right? Pacific Islander mix. And growing up, it was crazy because it was like, as Nick was mentioning, you know, Brother Nick, it was, you know, you have all these different types of things that you're being taught, right? How to live. And I remember when we were doing a documentary on my grandmother and the question of why did you migrate here? Why did you come to San Francisco? And just like everyone else, it was, um, you know, she wanted her five kids to have the best education for her grandkids that were being born to have a better life. And it's this whole American dream, right? Um, perception that everybody, everybody in all of our, our you know, countries and, and islands, you know, they think of America, they're like rich, power. They think automatically you come here, that's what's going to happen. You know, and they're not even knowing. No, it doesn't go down like that. There's no milk and honey. And even if there is, you're going to get taxed for it and you got to buy it, but you got to work your ass off to go get it. You know, it's like those stuff is not, it's not being told. The commercials are not advertising that. It's false advertisement, right? And so here we are and here goes you know, um, folks like myself, um, you know, being born and raised here, I don't know nothing else but to be American. You know, it's like, I'm American. But then again, we have this heritage, we have this culture, we have a lineage, you know, um, our DNA, you know, is the America is a place. But our DNA says we're Samoan, we're German, we're, you know, Central American, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, how can we blend this? And it was something for um, my dad and I, you know, he would always say, you know what, if we were back in Samoa, like, this is not how you guys would be acting. I was like, uh, hello, how can we be Samoan? I don't know nothing about being Samoan, right? I've never been to the island except Treasure Island, Angel Island, Alcatraz Island, like Treasure Island. Those are the only islands I've ever been. And so we used to bump heads a lot. And then, you know, I used to say, man, you know, my dad, he's a chief, you know, from um, his village. And I said, well, it's not like I could just go to a job and say, hey, give me a job because my dad's a chief. Like, it doesn't work like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm a princess. So how is that like working together, you know, um, for someone with a, such a young mind trying to find their own identity? And then, you know, the internal stuff for me was, even my own culture was like shunning me away because they would be teasing me saying, you know, Afokasi or half breed. That's what it means. Right. Um, and so I was never fully embraced or accepted. And so now it's like, you know what? I got to a point. I didn't want to be hurt. I didn't want to, you know, now I'm rebellious. Now I'm, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And then there wasn't enough education or awareness in the the educational institution even teach me about my culture. Nothing, you know, just about war, war, and, you know, our island being utilized during that, you know, war to recruit and hide away and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, where is it? Where is the beauty? And so fast forward, you know, here we are today. And I think what I've, you know, realized internally for myself is I've learned to finally see the beauty of my culture. And I think what has been missing this whole time until this journey happened for me to work with my Pacific Islander, you know, um, heritage and culture was it helped me in a personal way find my identity, you know, not just as the American that I am or the San Franciscan or 49er fan, I just had to throw that in there, um, that I am, right? It's, mm -hmm. no, I have a very rich culture and heritage as a Pacific Islander and it's beautiful. So, you know, I, I think um, that a lot of the generations um, like myself, a lot of the young people right now, you know, um, that's one part. You know, especially when you're getting in middle school, that's when everybody's trying to look their, you know, for themselves. They're trying to find themselves. You know what I'm saying? That's like a critical way. And then hormones, all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a mess. No, I got you. Um, but you know what? Um, and thank you for sharing that. That is, that is really, like, recognizing our beauty is very important. But, you know, Nick was saying, like, 
all of us we're, we're trying to integrate we're trying to stimulate but then there's a narrative that's being placed upon us that's outside of our control i think this is what vaga you were saying is like this geopolitical tension that's happening right now in the us and china and other countries that's negatively impacting asian american Do, would you agree or what, what are your thoughts on on that uh vaga in terms of uh um I love this question. I love when I saw it, I was like, oh man, we are about to go there. And I love it. Right. And I absolutely love it. Um, you know, the um the 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 leader, you know, Trump, the leadership of this country, you know, Trump didn't make it any easier, right? Like um what he did and what folks, you know, what what it what it done, you know, the narrative around, you know, just our Asian brothers and sisters, right? It's just absolutely just horrible, right? And then you get the media running rampant with things, right? And then just makes it even worse, right? Um, so, but to me, the geopolitical war stuff is so different, right? That's happening in the South Pacific. And if there's any fight that I feel like is so important right now for Pacific Islanders is the fight in the Pacific right now, right? And this is why when you said, when you launched the question earlier, I thought you were going to go there, right? Like, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to, you know, the geopolitical forces, you know, the, the superpowers that are at war right now, right? Um, where do we stand, you know, as Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, right? You know, when it comes to, you know, because right now America is like, they're positioning themselves in the Pacific, right? They just like established uh, a few more U.S. embassies, right? They're trying to make a presence out there. You know, China's been out there forever. Right. I'm not saying Chinese people. I'm not, you know, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, I'm against, but when we're talking about geopolitical and these superpowers like at war, right? There's been so much, you know, concerns and like problems in the Pacific, you know, with China that has exacerbated some of the poverty out there for a long time. And so in terms of that discussion, in that discussion, right, like where do we stand here in America as AAPIs? Right, because what's happening back at home in Tonga, Hawaii, uh, Guam, Samoa, right, Kuvalu, you know, Fiji, right, all that impacts what's happening here in America, right? What's happening here in America? So I'll tell you something. We had we were we had a meeting with the Secretary of the State's team, right? They came, launched, had a conversation about what they're getting ready to do. They want to amp up on like you know their presence in the Pacific, right? And you know. The conversation we put on the table was, listen, this isn't like, you know, when you guys first came out here and colonized everything, right? We're now in a better situation where there's more educated, more established Pacific Islanders. We need to be at the forefront of this fight, right? So if we're going to be doing anything out here in the South Pacific, geopolitical powers, right? We need to be at the forefront. All that to say, right, I don't want to get into the weeds, right? Like there is a fight happening in the South Pacific right now. And Biden is really, you know, for what it's worth, you know, he's launched the uh, NH, AANHPI, you know, initiative that their first federally government, federal government, you know, initiative being streamlined throughout the country, right? Um, where do we stand, you know, as a community of AANHPIs when it's come when it comes to this kind of issue, right? That that to me is a very interesting conversation to be had, right? And I, I don't think that me personally, I don't think it plays into the narrative of like what's happening racially, what's going on, right? I think th I think that is something very very different. I think that is just like people are just like you know that that is a power fight right now that is happening. And I think for us, are we Americans at that point, and are we going to stand as Americans, you know, to defend what we feel like is at our best interest for our our country, right? Or or what is it, right? So, but love the question. I think it's a dialogue. I don't have a a, a direct or clear response or answer to it. But I just love the fact that it was brought up tonight. And I think it's a conversation that we should continue to have because it definitely is, is going to impact. San Francisco, you know, is actually pioneering a lot of stuff for NHPIs, right? And, and our Asian American communities, right? But we have to get better at the state and local level to supporting our Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders if they're going to get ready to have this war, right? That that means they we really need to be investing in into the AA and HPI communities and making sure that we're our home base is like supporting and strengthening, you know, our 
our folks, our American uh, Asian NHPI folks, such a long acronym, you guys. We got to <laughs> put some numbers on there or something. <laughs> but you, you guys get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. I but I, I'll just leave it like that. Super excited about the question. Would love to continue the conversation, you know, and, and so forth and to hear from our colleagues. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, that question. We can go ex so much longer on that one question alone. That's why I kind of save it um, for a little towards the end. But um, I wanted to um, get to some of the questions in the chat. But I wanted to see if uh, Gainer or Nick, if you had some response to what Falgo was saying around the fight in the Pacific, how that's going to come home, right? And how do we? How, where do we stand on it? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Gainer. Go for it. I'm going to be real quick. Um, I feel that something that Faunga, you know, Brother Faunga just said, where would we stand here, you know, being American? Because we could sit over here and say we're, oh, we're standing in solidarity. And then the war happens. It's like, you know what, F them and da 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 da. Like, where do we stand? How important is it not just for us here, you know, seeing that we are now woke? right at, at saying hey we're we're together like this we're gonna rock with each other mm -hmm. can this also be implemented or practice in our you know homelands you know and from us so i'll just leave it at that because i'm about to go into a whole conspiracy yeah. theory talk and that's going to be two hours so yeah appreciate that anything uh for you nick uh, uh i can Call questions. G would love to, would love to conversate with y'all about that about that conspiracy. I would I would hear I would hear more about that. I'm like, can we can we do a part two? Um, yes, yes. I think, <laughs> and I think just like to build off of it, I think the answer is yes. There is a tension that that is going to impact Asian Americans. I mean, we're already seeing it right now. Um, I'm not sure if folks know, but there's uh, several red states in the South, including Texas, where I'm from, that they're introducing land ban bills. This is additional surveillance measures that's taking place um, and that state legislatures are introducing and they're in the, what they called alien land laws. And California, you know, to use that word woke, uh, California wasn't always woke. They actually introduced a land ban law. Um, and that's actually being repeated today. And it's being designated to target folks from specific Asian and other foreign countries from being able to purchase property. And the impact of this, right, would be that um, it would be how and when migrants or immigrants are able to establish their roots by owning a home, starting a business, just trying to live and be a part of this economy that we have, this land that we're on, that's not even ours, right? It's like, how can you say you don't, you can't purchase? Mm -hmm. And so it's this reality that when we observe the correlation of conflict between our governments, between US and China, that actually will mean more racism, it might be increased and we're gonna experience it at home. And I appreciate the folk, the fact that my PA siblings are talking about this idea that, yeah, when, when it hits the fan, when we go to war, it's like, will you still stand with me? Because I'm not sure that that's what happened around Japanese internment. I'm not sure that that's what happened when my grandparents were not able to immigrate here um, because of the way that they looked. I think when this happens, there's this deeper question that's gonna, that goes beyond this of, yes, it's gonna impact us negatively, but how do we move forward in solidarity to say, no, we're gonna stand up against this. And so a lot of the work that we're doing at Chinese for Affirmative Action and Stop API Hate is actually addressing this, right? So of course there are legitimate concerns and threats around relations with China. Yes, it's very complex and high level, but at the same time, when we see the media or political figures or these bills being introduced, this is a, this is a threat because they're gonna start using pointed language that's gonna blame, stereotype and scapegoat. And it's going to really embolden these white nationalists and extremists to attack and target our communities. And that's something that we have to stop before it actually goes into law. And I think that kind of goes back to the original idea that I had. It's like, who are those players that we have elected? Why, did, why are they still there? Why are they the ones that are creating these laws and authoring these bills and passing them? How do we stop them? How do we work together to stop them? And so at, at Stop People Hate, we have this campaign that we're working on to really address this issue around national security scapegoating, because we know that this rhetoric is just gonna drum up fear mongering right. and inflammatory levels of violence. And, and we've, gotta, we've gotta work together to band together to say, no, we don't want this to happen. That this land is actually for all people. 
Right. And and it, that's, that's a great segue into a question from, from one of our audiences. Speaking of elected officials, right? We have 2024 election coming up and we have some big players that's running to be to to be in, in, into office. So as AAPI, as Pacific Islanders, what are your what are your concerns? What are your hopes for this election that's just around the corner? Baga, I think this is right up your alley. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think just just staying on topic for like our folks, right? Like, uh, I'm going to call it the acronym, you know, so mm -hmm. I don't list the whole thing out. You know, just staying, just staying, just staying in that lane, right? Like, I, I think we, you know, one, we need leaders who, who understand our, our people, right? like our culture. And I'm not sure I, I, I've heard of any names yet or any people that are coming out of the communities, you know, Asian community, Pacific Island communities, right? And if there isn't any, I think that's a problem. I really do think that's, I think um, um, San Francisco being the city it is, you know, predominantly Asian, Asian city right now, large population, right? Like we need Asian leadership here, culturally competent Asian leadership that understands, you know, um, our range as a family, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also think like, you know, again, like if you talk about politics, right? Like we also need individuals who are gonna commit to policies and campaigns that actually like have teeth and, and that are able to like, you know, push, implement, then follow, then follow through, you know, uh, we need to see more like, you know, and we, we need folks to be able to like bring us into leadership, right? We need more like, you know, <coughs> so that we're, we're able to, you know, guide the work, right? I still think there's a lot, <clears throat> there's a lot for us to do. We've made headways, but I think, you know, there's only so much pushing we can do. And, so, you know, we, we need the system to work for us right now. Right now, it feels like we're still kind of trying to get it to, like, acknowledge us, right? Kind of like why we're here today, right? Yeah. We need the system, like, to, to, to work for us right now, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I think it's I think it's early. You know, we'll see what happens. You know, I think people should uh, to vote with their conscience. You know, do your homework. You know, do your homework. You know, go meet people. People will love to talk to you, right? And, uh, you know, hopefully we can get some good leaders in, in office and, you know, give, we got to get the politics in the city, get back to, you know, get back to the people. We got to get centering the people. We got to center our people again and do what's right for our, for our, for our city and our people. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree with you. Um, Eric, can I jump in there too? Yes, um, yes, please do. I, just as, as a really brief response, I, I really agree with that too. And I think there's this other idea of can we also interrogate and to question those that are running for office and to ask uh, with curiosity, mm -hmm. who are you? Where did you come from? Like, and not in, this, not in the racial way, like more like, where did, did you just come out of the weeds? Like what, what's going on with your situation? What's your story? What's your background in the community? Um, how have you been held accountable? How have you grown? I think there are these questions that now I ask as an advocate of people in power of what's your story and what's your relationship to me and the community that I live in and who you who are you are choosing to represent. Um, and then just the second piece is like, I'm pretty sure like some of our organizations here may have voter guides um, when elections come up. And so please look at voter guides, host um, voter election parties, voting guide parties to have dialogue and conversations and like look out for things on social media and look out for things that you can print and share that's gonna be in language. For folks i think the key is in language like we really have to work on developing resources that are in language for our elders for our seniors for community members who don't speak this dominant language it's got we've got it it's got to be about language access and diversity yeah and thank you for that nick and you know just the last thought on that I, I i what really scares me though is we're having this conversation in california but outside of california is is a whole different world it's like a wild wild west that we, we can't go to disney world anymore right we can't go to texas right now we, we're not sure what's going to happen and then the midwest is 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 also up for grabs as well and so so can we only stay in california to be safe i don't know um but uh, i i, I want to be uh respectful of our time uh, g do you want to have a last thought before i hand it back to eric 
No, I think I um, I echo everything that, you know, my brothers have uh, just mentioned and uh, as you, but very important, get out there and vote, you know, get your people, you know, your, your family, I mean, you know, get there to vote because it's so important, but definitely, definitely do your homework. Like when uh, every year I get excited ever since I was 18, that was what I wanted for my 18th birthday, just to vote, right? That's how I knew. I, I'm not a politician, but I'm political. So I, um, you know, the importance of that is, you know, it makes such a huge difference. And at the end of the day, it's like, that's the only way that we are going to sit here and be able to get rid of all this corruption, all this hate, all the everything, everyone, you know, uh, and all of us know. And I know some people think it doesn't make a difference, but it does. But then also like how I pick who to vote is going back to what Brother Nick just mentioned. Uh, if I ain't known you from the community, you just popped out of nowhere. It's like, wait, what have you done before? Like I do background checks to the background checks, street checks, federal checks. I do all them checks, you know, for myself, because for me, at the end of the day, I want to know you're the representative that we're voting for. That is going to be our voice in those arenas and spaces that we are not invited to, that we are not. And so, again, you cannot continue to sit there to make, you know, choices and decisions saying it's on behalf of us when there's no us there. There's just you. And so, you know, making sure that, you know, our people are aware of that. They understand that. You know, because that's another thing. A lot of our elders, too, they don't understand what they're voting for. So they sometimes they just mark or they don't understand this person is good or what they've contributed. You know, so I feel like it's also our job to get out there and make sure that, you know, um, not to, you know, everybody makes their own choice, but at least be aware of, uh, of where these, you know, constituents or candidates are, you know, coming from, because lately, you know, we've had people from down yonder come over here to interrupt our politics and then bam, they're gone. You know what I'm saying? And then mm -hmm. you leave this mess and where are you? You know, you came and start, started up all this stuff, but we know it was because you were trying to show that you can interrupt San Francisco, the most political city, you know, here and the most political state of California. And they said, if we can interrupt then, then we can go on with our agendas that we're trying to do in the whole nation. So people got to be careful. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and I apologize to um, uh, Hanoa for, for not having time to go to your questions. And thank you, Kimberly, for your for your comment. Um, I'll, I, I just want to hand it back to Eric to, to sign us out. But before I do so, Thank you so much for this amazing discussion. I feel like we're just getting to the heart of the matter, starting to turn interesting. The plot is turning. Um, you know, we definitely need to have uh, another conversation. But you know what? This partnership doesn't have to stop here because we're we're in this together. We're serving the same community. So let's continue to come together. Let's build upon this and 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 make our voices heard by working together. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being part of this panel. Thank you for joining Glide today. Um, Eric, uh, handing back to you to sign us out. Yes, thank you, Tree. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you, panelists, and Tree, you as a host. Amazing conversation. We hope to have you guys back soon. Uh, please join us next month for our next uh, monthly virtual event to celebrate our trans pride, courage, and strength, which is Thursday, June 29th, 2023. And please sign up to become a justice warrior, warrior at glide.org under the Center for S Social Justice page. So thank you, everyone. Good night, panelists and hosts. Can you please just hang on a little bit for tonight? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.